To be honest, I wasn't going to make a video about the observer pattern. It feels played out on YouTube. Dozens of beginner videos about the same two things, updating UI and the new input system. So today we'll quickly look at the basics, but the bulk of this video is going to be about building a generic observer so that you can observe property and field changes in play mode. And then we're going to take it even further so that you can observe values in edit mode and start building more complex tools using the Unity Event Tools class. As always, don't forget to hit the like button when you learn something new today. Let's get into it. Let's review a basic use of the observer pattern. A delegate type is a bit like an interface. It specifies the signature of a method. All delegates are multicast in C-sharp, which means it can hold references to more than one function. And when it's invoked, it calls each of the methods it references in turn one after the other. The next line declares an event named on any collected using the previously defined notify delegate type. The event keyword in C-sharp essentially adds safety features by restricting how the delegate can be used. For example, it can only be invoked from within the class or struct where it's declared, and external code can subscribe or unsubscribe for an event using the plus equals or minus equal operators, but cannot directly manipulate the list of subscribed delegates. Programmers still use delegates over shorthand action or func when they want to make code more understandable or self-documenting, but in most cases, people just use func when they want to return value and action when they do not. So for this simple example, when the player bumps into a collectible, it's going to fire off the trigger. The trigger will invoke our action. Any subscribers to the action will receive the points for this collectible, and then we'll just disable the game object. To make this work, let's just make another class called Score Manager. It'll have a text field. It'll keep track of our current score. And we're going to have it subscribe to our static event on our collectible class. And we'll just have an add score method. Whenever the event is fired, we're going to increase the score and update our text. Let's make sure that we unsubscribe for the event too. I'm just going to move the subscription down into on enable because I prefer it that way. And I'm going to move the updating of the text into its own method because I also want to call it on awake just so we make sure that the score text is going to be zero right at the start. I'm just going to change these into expression body methods so it's a little bit shorter. Now back in Unity, I've already put the scripts onto the various game objects. So you can see here on this collectible, I'm just going to change it to 50 points on this one, but I'll leave the other box just at 10. And I've already put the script onto my HUD with the score text. So just hit play and you'll see how it works. Everything will hook up and subscribe to the events right from the start. You can see the score is zero. If I come over here and grab this box, suddenly we have 50 points. And if we come over here to the other box, it should go up by another 10 points. There we go, 60 points. So that's as far as we're gonna go with the simple observer. I'm just gonna come out of play mode again here. And I think what I'm gonna do is actually just disable these two boxes because we're not gonna work with collectibles anymore. For the rest of this video, what I want to talk about is using a generic observer of type T. We'll store our type T as a private field value, but we can expose it to the editor so we can set it. And then we're going to associate this with Unity events. Let's expose T as a public property, but we're going to have a special method set. Whenever we set the value, we're going to notify observers that it's potentially been changed. Before we get to that, let's set up a constructor for this. The constructor needs to accept our value t and could potentially take in a first unity action. Let's default it to null so we don't have to specify it if we don't want to. We'll set the value. If the callback wasn't null, we'll add that as a listener to our unity event. And let's make sure that we initialize our unity event whenever the constructor fires. In our set method, let's say if the value coming into the set method is the same as the value we already have, let's bail out. Now, I want to keep invoke as a separate method because we might want to call it at other times. And it can handle some other things for us, such as debugging. Let's put a debug statement here that'll actually tell us how many events are we actually going to invoke here. And then let's actually invoke them by passing in the value. Let's add some methods so that we can add and remove listeners. I'll let Copilot fill in some of this, but basically, let's do some defensive null checking. If everything's good, let's add the listener. Exactly the same thing for removing a listener. Let's also make a method so that we can remove all listeners. And finally, just for the sake of completeness, let's have a dispose method so that we actually remove all listeners and we just reset some values here. Come back up to the top and actually make the set and invoke methods public so that I can call them from whichever class is declaring an observable T. 
Let's come over to our empty hero class here, and I'm going to declare a public observer of type int. That'll be for our health, and we'll just start it with 100. Now, in the start method, I'm going to invoke that, so any Unity events that are defined in the editor will fire off. Let's add an update method so that I can test this out. So whenever I press the 1 key, I want my health to go up by 10. Uh, let's do a bit of cleanup here. We actually don't need a serialized field here since this is public. One more thing, I've got a health display script already written. It just has a reference to the text of my health, and it has a public method that we can use to change that message. Let's recompile and go back to Unity. So over here in the inspector, you can now see I have this observable health value, and it has room for some Unity events. So we can drag in our health display reference here and call its public method, which accepts an integer. So I'll just come over here to my health display, and I'm going to drag that in. And then I can select its method. It's a little bit off screen, but it's there at the top because it matches the signature. That's really it. Let's press play and try it out. So in play mode here, you can see it right away. It invoked the event, so it set it to 100. Now I pressed 1, it went up to 110. Let's press it again, and so on. It'll just keep going up by 10s every time I press the button. So at this point, you might be thinking, great, how is this going to help me out? First of all, when you have behavior associated with a value, start thinking about using an object to encapsulate it. You'll end up with something much more powerful and easier to debug than using just the basic constructs of the language. But beyond that, I want to introduce you to the Unity Events Tools class, which is going to allow us to start adding Unity Events programmatically in edit mode. Up at the top of my class, I'm going to add system reflection and using unityeditor.events. Now down in our public method add listener, we can add the Unity Editor directive and do some special stuff when we're in edit mode. So all we're going to do here is just use one of those methods from the Unity Event Tools class to add a listener during edit mode. And we can do the same thing in the public method remove listener. Now we're going to have to do something a little bit special when we want to remove all listeners because there is no real method to do that. So what we'll do is use some reflection. First, let's get the field info of a private field in the Unity event base class, which is named M persistent calls. The field info object has a method named get value that retrieves the value of the field from an object, in this case, the on value changed event object. We can then use reflection again to get the method named clear. We can then evoke the clear method on the value. Now, this effectively will clear out the persistent calls list of the Unity event. For interest's sake, let's go and have a look at the Unity event base class which all Unity events inherit from. The easiest way to do that, I find, is just to declare a variable of that type and then command click into it. It'll decompile in Rider here, and here we go. So you can see right here at the top, we've got our M persistent calls. It's private persistent call group type. So let's click into there and see if we can't find this clear method. And just a little bit down here, you can see here is the clear method. So it's not doing anything magical, but the only way to get at it, because up in the Unity event base class, it's marked as private, we need to use reflection. Okay, let's come out of here. I'm just going to remove that declaration that I made and clean up a little bit. And what we can do now is think about how we can use this in an editor tool. Now, I've already started a class here. It doesn't do anything special. It's just overriding the on inspector GUI and calling the base class. You can see Rider's even graded out because it does nothing. So just a few rules before we start adding persistent events. The referencing type must be Unity Engine object. The method that we call has to be public. No anonymous or lambdas. And the parameter type has to match. Now, the reason for that is that everything that we put into the Unity event has to be serializable. So in our tool here, let's get a reference to our hero, which is the target of this inspector. And let's start adding some buttons. We can have a button to increase health, one to decrease health. And then what I want to do is have two more buttons that will add or remove a debugger. Now, I've made a tiny debugger singleton, which inherits from Unity object and has a method that will match the signature that we can use just for this example. So we can have a button that will add that method and one that will remove it. Let's just take a quick look at the debugger. It's super simple. It's just inheriting from a boilerplate singleton and has a method that matches the type of Unity event we want. Okay, so back here in Unity, I'm going to click Add Debugger and watch what happens. We serialize one of these methods right into our Unity events. That also automatically added a singleton for me. 
Now, if I jump into play mode right away, we see that our start method invoked the two listeners and we see the debug message as well as showing the correct health amount. Now I can start moving the health up and down, no problem. But what happens if I remove the debugger and then come out of play mode? Well, guess what? That we already serialized that onto the object, so there it is. No problem. That thing is going to persist, hence the name persistent. Um, what else can we try here? Well, how about if we just clear this up again and I remove the debugger, what's going to happen? Let's go into play mode and see what happens if I were to add a debugger now. If I click the button, you see it will add the debugger here, but it's not going to serialize it because we did it in play mode. So we come out of play mode and it's gone. So these editor methods work just like dragging and dropping. So for example, right now we could just add another Unity event here. And technically we could just drag in this singleton and reference the method on it. Oops, I missed there, drag it again. And now we can just grab the debugger debug method again. And you'll see it serialized it just as if we had done it programmatically. And that's the expected behavior. Just one more feature I want to add to this today, and that is the implicit operator. Instead of having to call health.value every time you want to get the value out of this public property, we can just use an implicit operator to just convert whatever our value t is right out into that type automatically. So that's just a shorthand way of saying that when we request our health property, we don't have to tack on the dot value. It's just going to implicitly convert our property into the value integer that we want. Now, as an example of that, let's just come back to the hero class and add a bit of code to our start method. So we could say in example one, we'll get health dot value. So we'll grab the property, but in example two, we'll just get health. And you can see already in the code hint here, it's casting it as an integer. But let's see what happens when we debug this out. Does it, is example one equal to example two? And what if we just debug the health object? What is that gonna say? Let's recompile and hit play. So we can see that example one was equal to example two, but when we just debug the object itself, it's actually telling us that it's an observer of the system integer 32 type. I will say one thing about implicit operator, and that is it does have some overhead, so don't go throwing it everywhere, but once in a while, it's very useful. I was thinking a cool editor tool that uses this might be to observe a challenge rating on an enemy in the editor, and as your game designers increase the challenge rating, your listeners can configure the enemy with different strategies or gear. The only limitation really is your imagination. I think that'll have to be a topic for a future video, however. If you want to learn more about advanced game events, check out the Event Bus video, and I'll see you there.